Hello and welcome to this Telecoms.com webinar, delivered in association with Sigma Designs. I'm James Middleton, Managing Editor of Telecoms.com, and I'm joined today by Vikram Srivastava, Director of Marketing for Set-Top Box Solutions at Sigma, and Milya Timagaleva, Vice President of Market Strategy at Oregon Networks. Today we're going to look at IPTV, a great success story. Research from Informal Telecoms and Media shows that by the end of 2011, there were 34.3 million households taking a paid-for IPTV subscription as their primary TV service. And the researcher forecasts that this total will more than double over the next five years, with 42 million pay IPTV homes to be added by the end of 2016, taking the global total to somewhere in the region of 76.5 million. There are great opportunities in the space, Revenues are predicted to almost double up to 11.9 billion in 2016, up from 6.2 billion in 2011. Uh, that's the US dollars. Bear in mind that the vast majority of IPTV subscribers are taking triple or dual play packages. I mean, this spells good news for the telcos, as they will achieve higher blended ARPU figures through bundling, but it also means that TV ARPU will fall as bundled subscribers will pay proportionally less for the TV part of the service. Still, telcos tend to look at TV as a customer retention tool, where triple play bundles attract and keep subscribers. However, the TV part of the bundle is often only for free-to-air channels, so subscribers are rarely paying for premium TV services through their triple play bundle. In competitive markets, telcos often have to soak up the costs of subsidising or even giving away free set-top boxes in the triple play scenario, but remember that many telcos have deep pockets and see this as an expenditure well worth undertaking. So naturally, service providers are looking for ways to join in on accelerating the IPTV trend in all market sectors, such as cable, terrestrial and satellite. IPTV operators can have a disruptive effect on all dis distribution platforms in competitive markets, including other IPTV operators. Through triple play bundles, Telcos are bringing down TV ARPU figures, though overall blended ARPU is higher. Cable operators have followed suit, especially when they offer triple play packages. They often offer cheaper mini packages to triple play subscribers, and the greater rivalry means customers are being offered more content and services at very reasonable rates. One of the key areas where there is a great opportunity and fierce competition is in the hybrid TV space. Combining both IPTV as a medium with broadcast, all access via the same integrated interface. It seems like a no-brainer. It has the benefit of making the TV experience both more personal and more social. But it must be acknowledged that creating such a solution takes some unique development on both the hardware and software side. The shift is coming as key players across the TV value chain are acknowledging changes in the ways viewers want to discover and consume their content with technology providers developing new products to serve these needs and digital TV platform operators seeking to incorporate such products into their services to improve the customer experience. The need to present an advanced and compelling pay TV proposition is particularly pressing for some carriers, which are often under increasing competition from the over-the-top or OTT service providers that offer similar consumer propositions in terms of film and TV content. A hybrid set-top box would typically provide access to free-to-air channels, along with premium offerings such as sports, perhaps via digital terrestrial TV, and video-on-demand programs via IPTV. Most content is provided via subscription packages, with a selection available on a pay-per-view basis. Added interactivity is facilitated through social and personalization experiences, whereby an operator might add a system of recommendations whereby automated program suggestions are made to the viewer based on his or her TV viewing preferences. Customers could also share programming likes and opinions on what they are watching with their friends. But there's belief that offering greater interactive services such as non-linear, time-shifted and multi-room alone will drive up subscriptions and profitability. Yes, one of the inherent advantages of an IP delivery network is the ability to easily add on these sorts of services but they're no longer unique. Cable operators that have made the shift to digital can offer like-for-like -like services, and DTH providers such as B-Sky B in the UK have long been using IP to this end and continue to innovate with hybrid delivery platforms. 
The old motto, content is king, might be a cliché, but it's nonetheless true. Interactivity and time-shifted viewing are redundant features unless viewers have access to high-quality content that they want to watch in the first place. The key to releasing this content, and something that will be discussed at length in this webinar, is driving demand for new TV navigation systems. The desire among a significant proportion of TV viewers is to make use of more intuitive content discovery mechanisms and has been demonstrated by consumer research conducted late last year by Red Bee on future media consumption. You can see from the chart here, recommendations were found to be a feature that 37% of the 1002 survey respondents wanted to see on new TV menus and navigation systems. In identifying the types of recommendations they would like to receive, the respondents expressed equal interest in those based on viewing behaviour, preferences put into the TV system, and rating or liking a programme, indicating interest in both automated personalisation and social TV capability. Improved search and navigation have been key themes in the digital TV market for a couple of years now. Operators such as BT Vision, B Sky B and Virgin Media are stepping up their efforts to create closer ties between their customers and the products they pay for, with a view to both improving the customer experience and finding new revenue streams. The growth of second screen devices and applications will play an important role in this trend. This is where the most intimate relationships between TV viewers and their TV products can be forged. With the information shared via the handheld connected device, unique to each person, more specific and detailed than that shared via the main, typically shared, TV set. Consumers today are coming to expect no discernible difference in quality between viewing content that is delivered via the internet and traditional broadcast programming. The proliferation of internet connected devices that are capable of displaying high quality video means consumers on the go are increasingly turning to PCs and tablets to view their content. But unlike the PC industry, which typically offers higher margins for manufacturers, the television-centric consumer electronics industry relies on the availability of cost-effective yet sophisticated media connectivity chipsets, such as those provided by our host today, Sigma Designs. In order to serve the mainstream consumer, an operator subsidised SDB market. During this webinar, we're going to hear about how Sigma can facilitate service providers getting to market quickly by partnering with the strong middleware providers such as Oregon, which has its Onks browser, and learn how TV service providers and manufacturers can be empowered with the tools to create service differentiation and new revenue models through innovative apps and increased viewer engagement. Some of the key areas that are going to be addressed will be looking at changes in chip architecture in order to support hybrid implementation, how software for broadcast differs from that for broadband, addressing the media processor challenges with container support, browser support, user interface and user experience, integrating web video channels and apps for service providers, looking at a full toolkit for operators to pick and choose from and how to take over-the-top services and blend them seamlessly with broadcast content. Both Milia and Vikram will be available to take your questions after their respective presentations. Uh, you can ask a question at any time during the webinar. Just type it into the text box that you see on this page and they will answer in real time when they finish speaking. I'm going to hand it now to Vikram. Hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar of the marriage of broadcast and broadband and the uh, importance of hybrid IPTV set-top boxes. My name is Vikram Srivastava. I'm Director of Marketing at Sigma Designs. And uh, I will be uh, talking to you today about the new trends uh, that we see in the world of uh, hybrid IPTV set-top boxes, why are they becoming more important for Sigma Designs, and the trends that we see uh, in the industry driving the increased adoption of hybrid set-top boxes. So why do we need a alliance between broadcast and broadband leading to these new category uh, of set-top boxes uh, called as hybrid IPTV set-top boxes? One of the key things that we have seen over the last few years is that over-the-top content has now becoming so compelling that we are seeing increased viewing amongst consumers of uh, OTT content on uh, set-top boxes or whether it's uh, retail products like TVs and Blu-ray players, that is almost uh, also a serious cause for increased broadband consumption, 
In some cases, we've seen metrics of almost 30% of broadband consumption during prime time being due to uh, OTT viewing. With this increase of OTT content, we are seeing a demand that traditional set-top boxes are facing challenges where broadcasters or service providers are losing revenue from their traditional pay-per-view service or their near video-on-demand service because of these OTT services, whether they are uh, online catch-up services or they are movie rental services like Netflix. And with that, the trend is now that some of the set-top boxes that we see coming out on the market shortly uh, will include both an IP capability to provide some of these OTT services and also provide some capability to have your traditional linear TV programming provided through broadcast, whether it's terrestrial, satellite, or cable. So what has led to this uh, revolution of uh, over-the-top content? In its very early days, OTT was basically uh, many times just dubbed as Internet TV. It was uh, highly PC dominated. Uh, in some cases, they were just very simple PC clients uh, that were available to view low bitrate, low quality encoded uh, TV programming. Of course, uh, even YouTube was at one time bundled away into this category of uh, Internet TV. In the early 2000s, then, we saw a huge revolution of uh, video compression codecs. Uh, we saw a lot of them adopted into consumer electronics, but I think some of the most serious codec developments was that of H.264, which saw its adoption both into broadcast as well as into Blu-ray technology for offering high-definition consumer experience. H.264 since then has basically led the charge in encoding of new high quality content, uh, also making it more broadband suitable because of its capability to reduce the required uh, bandwidth by almost half. Then in the mid 2000s we saw increased broadband penetration both from DSL as well as cable technologies here in the US. And worldwide, uh, there's also been increased adoption of fiber. And more recently, we've seen the trends go from two, three hundred kilobits per second to one or two megabits per second, and now almost uh, 30 megabits per second on the high tiers of uh, broadband data rates available to a household. Then the late 2000s came, I think, a series of uh, innovations um, uh, for streaming technologies. We've seen now codecs get uh, more bundled away into production suits, into content delivery suits, into integration with CDNs like Akamai. And so we've seen platforms like Adobe Flash Stagecraft uh, moving to something called Adobe Air. And then, of course, increased adoption now of HTML5 as a uh, content delivery mechanism with now its the content media tags available within HTML5. So with that, what we are seeing now is uh, several content aggregators, content production houses are now uh, have a, a series of choices uh, with respect to platforms that they can use to develop content, prepare content, and deliver uh, content over a uh, broadband connection. And uh, with that, we are also seeing increased deals being formed between uh, content owners uh, amongst uh, Hollywood and uh, aggregators and uh, OTT application developers like Netflix. And with that, we will see more and more OTT services in order to capture uh, the amount of broadband households now that can uh, be a target for these OTT services. In all of this technology change that I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, Sigma has uh, been a leader pretty much being the first uh, to offer IPTV set-top boxes in the early 2000s, just when the uh, broadband uh, rollout was starting with uh, telcos worldwide. Sigma was also the first company to roll out a uh, SOC that can do multi-codec decoding. That means with a range of video codecs that could be used to decode uh, compressed video being received and uh, also the first to embed security in its uh, media processor so that as we saw more consumption of uh, content being delivered over broadband, we can also secure that using uh, secure DRM methods 
and hence reduce piracy of uh, content being delivered, whether it's IPTV or now uh, even over-the-top content. And with that, Sigma led the market with respect to launch of these digital media adapters, which we saw uh, you know, from companies like Western Digital, uh, Cyabaz, uh, iOmega, uh, and ViewNow, where um, there has been a good blend of these adapters addressing both content that is owned by the end consumer as well as access to over-the-top content through uh, an application set available on these uh, digital media adapters. In all of this, Sigma has faced many challenges. We've seen the industry also uh, move in the mobile space where uh, one core is not enough. We are moving to architectures of multiple cores, uh, two cores, four cores, and so on. Uh, however, the key focus from Sigma has been to uh, invest in performance that makes sense uh, from an embedded video platform. So uh, just increasing the number of cores increases raw throughput. But in an embedded platform, the raw throughput is always challenged by the requirements of an embedded platform, whether it be uh, servicing the needs of a peripheral, like, um, like an Ethernet connection or a hard disk, to um, the demands from a real-time operating system that run on these embedded systems like a set-top box and also managing uh, the multiple video decodes uh, in the case of uh, complex media uh, rendering. And so, uh, you know, we are seeing multi-CPU uh, products showing up uh, in the Sigma roadmap. We've also seen adoption of some technologies from the PC side, uh, like that of L2 caches. These are very large memories that are bound to the CPU. We see the need of L2 caches uh, necessary in order to have uh, improved browser performance and JavaScript performance, uh, which basically uh, lead to snappy performance of uh, HTML5 and uh, other HTML5 uh, applications that use JavaScript as a core uh, mechanism for controlling the application. The other challenges has also been the demand from the consumer for uh, improved UI and improved user experience. This has led to choices of a graphical unit which can now support 3D graphics. Cores that support 3D graphics are now almost 25% of SOC uh, that Sigma makes today for uh, the hybrid space and IPTV set-top boxes. And uh, these GPUs are now uh, all OpenGL ES compliant so that they offer the latest in 3D uh, support with respect to transitions, special effects, and moving multiple objects uh, around. In fact, some of the new cores can even manage up to four video streams and treat them as a texture and manipulate them on the screen, leading to new concepts of an EPG. And that helps designers, uh, UI designers, to move away from the traditional grid. Uh, we are also seeing requirements of multiple planes of 3D rendering that are then blended and composited for a user experience. And all of this needs to happen on this SOC, staying within its uh, limited resources of an embedded platform. And so uh, Sigma has been integrating all of these technologies, making sure they work together and deliver within these limited confines and uh, price points of a embedded uh, set-top box. Here again, with respect to software, we need a plethora of stacks that basically need to execute on the hardware I just spoke about. Let's talk about broadcast first. Uh, on the broadcast side, uh, we used to see just the integration of a simple DVB stack to allow for channel zapping. And then with the uh, increased uh, amount of pay TV, we saw the integration of conditional access stacks from partners like Nagrovision and Verimatrix. And now, more recently, we are seeing interactive middleware stacks like HPB TV, UView, and Jenga. All of these now need to be made available on a broadcast uh, set-top box. However, on the OTT side of things, we need a whole series of uh, content delivery uh, or content access client technology, whether it's uh, Java-based, uh, an HTML5, a WebKit-based browser, 
and Adobe Flash platform, whether it is uh, their previous standard called StageCraft, or uh, even the new Adobe Air platform for delivering content to a client in an embedded platform. Just like on the broadcast side, uh, the IP side sees increased use of DRM from companies like Microsoft and Widevine. Uh, and then, of course, we need the various OTT applications that leverage all of these platforms and DRMs. And uh, again, the number of these OTT applications have been growing year on year, quarter on quarter, and uh, Sigma Designs is, is increasing its library of applications. So in the end, uh, even from a software point of view, there is a serious challenge on a software development kit that we offer with our SOCs for that pulls all of these six categories of software together uh, within our uh, uh, SDK. So to leverage our SOC hardware and our software SDKs, uh, we have partnered with Oregon Networks. Uh, which is an excellent example of a company that has been developing middleware and software applications that integrate both the broadcast capability as well as uh, OTT applications and several interactive applications that help uh, to improve the uh, user experience on a hybrid IPTV set-top box. Uh, once again, they've been able to develop multiple interactive applications that use the broadband connection to bring several services over into a set-top box, whether that's uh, just simple weather information or even more complex uh, integrations like uh, a Facebook client, etc. Uh, at the same time, they have uh, forged uh, many uh, relationships with OTT providers like uh, LoveFilm, BBC iPlayer, capability um, into their software and hence um, covering the entire range of uh, interactive applications that you would find on a hybrid IPTV set-top box. So uh, there are many trends that uh, Sigma C is going forward with respect to hybrid set-top boxes. I think we are seeing a demand for a content uh, push technology, whether that is a push from the set-top box to a mobile device or a mobile device pushing to a set-top box so that you can watch the content on the TV screen. Uh, we are also seeing increased adoption of uh, OTT by uh, traditional broadcast and service providers. In the U.S., more recently, we have seen some uh, very important announcements, say from Comcast with the launch of Xfinity Stream Picks, uh, also from Verizon with their joint uh, venture with Coinstar, both of them offering now online video rental services just like Netflix. Then we are also seeing uh, content aggregators like HBO offering their own services like HBO Go uh, as opposed to also the HBO services they offer through service operators and MSOs. So once again, OTT is, is so important that every uh, player in the traditional value chain of delivering content to a consumer is trying to explore its own um, angle of delivering content directly to a consumer. So we are seeing research from marketing firms like Informa, Telecoms, and Media showing uh, IPTV subscribers are doubling uh, from 2011 uh, from a total uh, base of almost 34 million households to 76 million households by the end of 2016 uh, receiving their programming via an IP connection. Uh, and what we will see uh, over this period is these IP set-top boxes will also support a form of broadcasting, most likely if it is a digital uh, terrestrial connection, we will see uh, integration of software like HBB TV and Jenga from a worldwide perspective. We will also see an integration of IPTV with some pay TV capability, whether that is satellite. We might also see some operators uh, like uh, satellite operators integrating OTT capability to basically add on video on demand services um, you know, to basically meet the challenge from OTT service providers. As we see in the market space uh, an evolution of technologies, I believe Sigma Designs is uh, all geared up to lead the charge of IPTV set-top boxes. 
We have uh, a technology roadmap that includes various uh, SOCs, our chipsets, SDKs, and frameworks that can help our customers reduce time to market uh, with respect to delivering set-top boxes that integrate uh, both broadcast and broadband technologies. We have uh, middleware partnerships in place like uh, with companies like uh, Oregon Networks to have software that is turnkey and easy to integrate on uh, hardware platforms. And we are also investing in operator relationships so that we can have an early access to testing platforms and, and, and bring up that we can perform on operator networks uh, and offer platforms that meet operator requirements as they roll out these aggressive uh, OTT technologies and hybrid IPTV set-top boxes. So I would like to thank everyone for uh, listening to my webinar. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Melia from Oregon Networks, and I'll stay online till the end of the webinar to answer any questions that you might have on the slides I've presented. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Vikram. Firstly, I'd like to thank Sigma Designs and Informa for inviting Oregon to participate in this seminar, which I hope will provoke questions and thoughts amongst the listeners, which Vikram and myself will be very happy to discuss. My name is Milia Timirgareva. I am VP of Market Strategy at Oregon Networks. During the presentation, I will cover the company overview, touch upon the hybrid TV industry trends and their influence on media delivery technologies, and finally cover the SDK facilities of Oregon Stack. For those who are less familiar with Oregon, I'd like to provide a brief introduction of the company. Oregon is a London-based enterprise operating in the Internet TV market since 1997. The company provides lightweight media browser solutions for retail consumer electronics and carrier-grade IPTV devices enabling delivery and sharing of internet video, music, and photos. Our headquarters and primary R&D center are located in London, UK, with international branch offices in Korea, Taiwan, and Argentina. Since inception, Oregon has been a strong proponent of open standards, a vision that has been fulfilled in the current state of the IPTV industry. The simplest way to explain the essence of Oregon's ONIC solution is to cover the key usages. In other words, the end user features it helps to enable in a connected TV or set-top box. Today's consumer is most certainly expecting to be able to have the flexibility and choice of entertainment timing, sources and types to cater for the multitude of viewing scenarios the software supports viewing and recording of content from personal sources, over-the-top media, including IPTV and user-generated content, media apps, which we refer to as widgets, and of course, broadcast sources. In the broadcast scenario, the stack supports terrestrial, satellite, and cable content, including the multi-room distribution scenario. IPTV incorporates linear multicast, VOD streaming, and progressive download. The personal content delivery feature enables the user to connect multiple living room and portable devices. Importantly, due to high level of integration, the stack enables to index and retrieve metadata from multiple sources, thus facilitating the so-called global media search. Onyx Media Browser is the flagship product of Oregon Networks. It represents a suite of media delivery solutions over managed and unmanaged networks. A couple of words on the industry trends. There are currently significant shifts in the way content industry operates, reverberating from the low-level silicon to network infrastructures and content protection mechanisms, including consumer-driven trends requiring the network operators to rapidly adapt their services. I'd like to touch upon the, the key three trends which we believe are currently shaping the roadmaps and challenges of service operators and have had direct impact on the architecture of the Onyx browser. Firstly, the pace of standardization around CHTML and HTML5 has made it possible for over-the-top and managed network services to be rapidly developed and deployed across multiple devices, 
in global markets. A new generation of Oregon software solutions for set of boxes bring scalability, personalization, and social features of the internet into the operator-driven environment using key elements of HTML. Secondly, the explosion of IP video and network consumption has led to continuous growth and innovation in core and last mile network infrastructures. Nevertheless, the internet as a global medium being intrinsically unpredictable and the majority of networks being composed of multiple diverse units, which in many cases came together as a result of consolidation, has necessitated other methods of delivering a quality of experience that can be on the par with traditional broadcast medium, no matter which network it is delivered on. Oregon Solution enables delivery of live and on-demand content via a set of adaptive big rate streaming technologies. These highly sophisticated technologies allow for the adaptation of the AV streaming rates to specific changing network and device conditions. Thirdly, we no longer can view traditional broadcasts in isolation from the internet medium. The hybrid nature of Oregon Stack allows operators to weave the responsiveness, relevance, and social aspects of the internet into their next generation services. Oregon has implemented variants for the Latin American, European, and Asian markets that have adopted DVBT or ISDBT digital broadcast standards on their path towards the digital switchover. As part of its multi-regional hybrid solution for telecom and broadcast operators, Oregon has emphasized the specific requirements of the emerging broadband and pay TV market in Latin America based on the trend for the ICBT standard adopted by the majority of countries in the region, including Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and Peru, to become the second most widely spread digital TV standard. Oregon's ISDBT stack is designed to SBTVD specifications, also known as ISDBT International, and has been field proven with broadcast across countries in Latin America, including Brazil, where it has also passed certification by Anatel, the Brazilian telecoms regulator. Importantly, key elements of HVBTV allowing cross-referencing of IP and broadcast features are also built into this global solution. The benefits of following a set of uniform standards for AV applications and video delivery have been proven and accepted by multiple stakeholders in the media delivery value chain. Firstly, it provides chipset manufacturers with the ability to create solutions that incorporate the prevalent high compression codecs with maximum hardware acceleration. Secondly, it allows video management systems architects to keep the amount of encoded streams to a minimum, as well as reducing content delivery network requirements and costs. Thirdly, today's internet apps typically follow one of the three popular design standards, offering the means of multi-platform applicability and rapid deployment. Those are CHTML, a standard ratified by CEA in 2007. Secondly, it's uh, HTML5. Thirdly, Adobe Flash for digital home. The most recent approach that is quickly gaining traction is to support key relevant elements of HTML5, which enhance the interactive capabilities of web applications, simplify development process, and introduce uniform AV control APIs. The key component of HTML5 concerning OTT services is, of course, the enablement of an explicit dedicated video control API, the so-called HTML5 video tag. This facility allows content developers to deliver the video in multiple formats to multiple devices. Autoplay as soon as the video is ready, create playlists and loops, provide video controls, such as fast forward and rewind, and display video in different modes, such as full screen mode or a smaller size window. For all intents and purposes, HTML5 is a UI authoring technology. 
It places no restrictions on the UI design in terms of their ability to run on smartphones, tablet PCs or TVs. The UI designer is free to choose to offer entirely separate HTML applications for each device, but reusing modules of the code that are not display type specific. Alternatively, the UI developer may offer a single application that automatically adapts its format layouts and interaction based on the device type that it's currently running on. Oregon's widely deployed HTML4 browser is now in the process of enhancement, which will see new products from Oregon with HTML5 support being released in the second half of 2012. As a media browser company, we've taken the approach of creating a fully encompassing hybrid media delivery engine from any source, complete with HTML5, adaptive bit rates, streaming, DRMs, and secure transaction mechanisms, as well as supporting traditional broadcast TV and DLNA. Oregon enables the full set of video streaming features over IP networks. This includes multicast live and VOD, trick modes, adaptive bitrate streaming, and content protection. We work closely with all participants of the value chain in order to provide secure video delivery solutions. The combination of Sigma's secure video processor and the tamp resistance capability integral to Oregon software stack ensure that operators can deliver the latest premium sports and Hollywood content reliably and confidently as part of a commercial pay TV operation. Oregon works with conditional access and DRM industry leaders, including Nagra, Microsoft, Secure Media, and Widevine, as well as enabling the HLS DRM solution based on 128-bit AES encryption that is also rapidly growing in popularity. The aim of Oregon's architecture is to address the three challenges of operators and device manufacturers faced in the hybrid OTT environment, the flexibility and customizability, integration complexity, and obsolescence. Oregon's technology and globalization SDK toolset enables device manufacturers and network operators to create with a single solution a service delivery platform that can be localized and applied to multiple geographic markets in significantly compressed timescales. Typically, the timescales from start date to pilot deployment can be as low as six months. As mentioned previously, Oregon software supports broadcast standards alongside internet browsing and media delivery technologies. The architecture diagram on this slide will allow you to visualize the extent of features and integration of the Onyx browser. The modules work in unison with a carefully tuned inter-process management mechanism, which allows the solution to optimize usage of the embedded hardware platform resources. In this case, the sum is really greater than its parts. The solution that currently runs on Sigma's cost-effective 8670 chipset allows a deploying customer to choose the appropriate modules of the Oregon software tailored to particular market segments or subscription tiers. In summary, the globalization SDK allows the operator to develop unique customer experiences through a combination of web browser-based user interfaces live and on-demand IP video streaming, broadcast TV, and home network features. With this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and thank everyone who has dialed in today. I'll be online to answer your questions, and you can find further information on Oregon software and services at www.oregon.net. OK, thanks very much, Vikram and Milia. Really enlightening opinions from you both. As I said before, both our speakers are going to be available now to take your questions. If you want to type them into the text box on the page of this webinar, then either Milia or Vikram will respond in real time. Thank you very much for joining us today on telecoms.com.